It's perhaps the most effective shortcut in the world. Slicing through the dense jungles of Central America, the Panama Canal bisects the continent, carving an 80-kilometer path that joins the Atlantic to the Pacific. For ships that pass through its intricate system of locks, it can chop up to 12,500 kilometers off their journey, a time-saving that puts even Egypt's Suez Canal to shame. When construction was finally completed in 1914, it was the most expensive infrastructure project ever undertaken and is still one of the engineering wonders of the modern world. Yet the tale of the Panama Canal is more than just the tale of a whole bunch of guys getting together to decide how to get boats from Port A to Port B in record time. It's also a tale of a dream, of a dream so big, so unimaginably vast that it persisted for centuries, and of the nightmares that were unleashed in pursuit of that dream. In the video today, we take a look at the epic story that is the history of the Panama Canal, a story stuffed with conquest, war, revolution, and the birth of the modern world. If the story of the Panama Canal is the story of a dream, then the Sandman responsible for that dream must be Vasco Núñez de Balboa. A conquistador who left Spain at the dawn of the 16th century, Balboa had one goal, to find as much gold as possible and impress the crap out of the king back home. But it wasn't gold Balboa ultimately found amid the jungles of Panama, it was something much more precious. He found the Pacific Ocean. Before Balboa sighted it in 1513, no European had ever set eyes on the Pacific. No one even knew Panama was just a narrow isthmus separating two mighty oceans. But now Balboa had seen this vast sea with his own eyes, the world would never be the same again. The first to recognize the value of Balboa's discovery was Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who, just to be confusing, was also Charles I of Spain. Realizing the new vistas of trade that could be opened up, Charles Double King ordered the Panama Regional Governor to figure out a shipping route between the Isthmus's coasts. It was a visionary idea. Unfortunately, just a little too visionary. The Panama governor went out, dutifully poked around the dense rainforest, measured the foreboding mountains, and declared, There is not a prince in the world with the power to accomplish this. And, well, that was that. But here's the thing about dreams. Although they fade, the brightest never vanishes entirely. And while Charles, the numerically confusing, wouldn't live to see it, his dream of a shipping route across Panama would resurface time and time again. In the following centuries, life on the Isthmus underwent dramatic changes. In the South American Wars of Independence, Panama first backed Spain before realizing Simon Bolivar was serious about the whole liberation thing and joining his new state of Gran Colombia. Unfortunately, Gran Colombia lasted a not-so-grand total of 11 years before Venezuela and Ecuador split, leaving a rump state that was essentially modern-day Panama and Colombia. At first, the two nations got on fine, but then in 1843, the government in Bogota revoked Panama's joint status, transforming the isthmus into just another province of Colombia. Needless to say, the Panamanians were not impressed, but what could they do? Colombia was a huge country with an army and, you know, proper city and stuff. What did little Panama have that could compete with that? Well, eventually the answer to that question would become very powerful friends. But first, they'd have to meet those friends. In 1846, not long after Panama was reduced to a mere Colombian province, officials in Bogota began to worry about British activity in the Caribbean. Not wanting to be subsumed into the ever-growing British Empire, they turned for protection to the only big kid in the American playgrounds. Uncle Sam heard the Colombian pleas with what we like to imagine was a bit of a smug smile before effectively holding up his hand and saying something like, Sure, I'll guarantee your neutrality from those alimies, but you gotta do something for old Uncle Sam in return. Like what? Probably came the answer. Well, you see that Panama of yours? Well, I'd like to move my ships from one ocean to the other. All you gotta do is give me exclusive transit rights. In our imaginary scenario, this would be the point when the big American giant stuck out his hand and said something like, What do you say, son? We got a deal? And what could the Colombians do? They agreed, signing the Bidlack Treaty in 1864. If Bogota's leaders had known this would end with the disintegration of their country, they might have thought twice.
The realization of old Charles's dream of crossing Panama began, as most major projects do, with the prospect of making a lot of money. In 1848, gold was discovered in California. The only trouble was, crossing America in 1848 wasn't exactly simple. You either had to head overland, a journey which might cost you your life, or you went by sea, which involved taking a boat all the way around Tierra del Fuego. So the idea of sailing down to Panama, skipping across the narrowest point, and sailing back up to California suddenly seemed mighty attractive. Between 1848 and 1855, Uncle Sam poured money into an overland crossing in Panama. Unfortunately, the Finnish railroad was both controversial and kinda crappy. Let's tackle the latter point first through the eyes of Ulysses S. Grant. In 1852, Grant was sent down to cross Panama at the head of the 4th Infantry. Unfortunately, it was rainy season. The railroad flooded out and cholera swept through the troops. By the time the 4th Infantry reached the Pacific, they'd lost 150 men. For the rest of his life, Grant would be haunted by nightmares of the journey. But what about the controversial part? Well, the presence of endless American soldiers crossing Panama sent the whole of Colombia into a nationalist spin. In 1856, anti-railroad riots paralyzed Panama. In the chaos that surrounded construction, 20 governors were deposed. Perhaps it's no wonder that even before the railroad was finished, people were muttering about replacing it with a canal. But it would be another 13 years before anyone pushed the project forward. Come 1869, Ulysses S. Grant had graduated to the White House. Still haunted by memories of his 1852 journey, Grant commissioned teams to go out and find if there was a way to spare others from that terrible ordeal. For five years, the U.S. Navy surveyed Central America. Finally, in 1875, they returned with their recommendations. The U.S. should build a canal through Nicaragua. Yep, the original plan wasn't to build in Panama at all. The only reason the canal ever went so far south is due to two men. The first was French diplomat Ferdinand de Lesseps. When de Lesseps saw the Yanks focusing on Nicaragua, he swept in and offered Bogota his expertise to build a canal through Panama. The offer wasn't nothing. De Lesseps was the guy behind the Suez Canal, the waterway joining the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. If anyone could build a huge continent bisecting canal, it was him. In 1880, Bogota gave de Lesseps the go-ahead. The Frenchman secured millions in backing and brought over the greatest engineers he could find. One of them just happened to be our second man. Philippe Benoit Varia was an engineer hired by de Lesseps. Although he would spend the next decade in the shadows, he would soon become very important. But only after he had helped de Lesseps waste millions of dollars. That's right. Waste. De Lesseps' idea was to build the canal at sea level, negating the need for locks. Unfortunately, this created a construction site that was prone to flash floods and landslides and filled with mosquitoes carrying malaria. Ground was broken on the French Canal in 1880. By 1888, 20,000 workers were dead and the canal was nowhere near finished. In a desperate last move, de Lesseps brought in Gustave Eiffel of Eiffel Tower fame to help design the locks for the canal. But it was too late. In 1889, funding was pulled on the project. De Lesseps, Eiffel, and others wound up in court back in France on charges of fraud. But one man escaped the wave of arrests and stayed on in Panama. Philippe Benalvaria refused to accept that the dream of the Trans-Panama Canal was dead. If no one else was going to make that dream a reality, then he would. We've all met people who are great at wearing other people down, who can just keep grinding away until everyone is too tired to do anything but agree and hope they'll go away. Philippe Bernal Varia was that guy on steroids. Starting in 1890, Varia launched an all-out lobbying campaign to convince the US to abandon its Nicaragua plans and complete the canal in Panama. At first, Washington was like, uh, no thanks, we got our own canal going on, we don't need yours. Then they moved on to, well, okay, we get your points about Panama, but we kind of already invested. Finally, after years of Varia's whining, they were all like, okay, goddammit, okay, we'll open a new commission to look into the Panama idea. All right, leave us alone. The U.S. Isthmian Canal Commission opens in 1899, tasked with re-examining the possibility of a Panama Canal. But it wasn't this commission, or even Varia, who would eventually decide the issue. It was events in Colombia. 
The same year the new commission opened, 1899, a slump in coffee prices hammered the Colombian economy. It came at a time when the country's liberals and conservatives were already at loggerheads and looking for an excuse to annihilate one another. So when unrest exploded in the coffee regions, both parties used it as a cover to spark a civil war. The Thousand Days War devastated Colombia. Between 1899 and 1902, it's estimated 130,000 people died in liberal and conservative violence. In the closing days, Panama was transformed into a battlefield, while Panamanian locals were dragooned into the two armies. By the time the war finally ended with a Pyrrhic victory for the conservatives, Panama was home to an angry and growing independence movement. Not coincidentally, 1902 was also the year Washington finally caved in to Varilla's cajoling and authorized the U.S. purchase of French land in Panama. Sensing the wind in his sails, Varilla turned his impressive powers of persuasion onto the Colombians, pressuring Bogota into signing the hay heron Treaty in 1903. In return for building the Panama Canal, the treaty not only ceded control of the canal itself to the U.S., but also an eight-kilometer strip of land either side. This was known as the Panama Canal Zone. This strip of land would cover 1,432 square kilometers of Panama, effectively creating a U.S. colony within Colombia. For Bogota, this was simply too much. The Colombian Senate rejected the treaty, citing loss of sovereignty. But that was fine with Varilla, who already had a plan B. In fall 1903, Varilla began siphoning funds from the Panama Canal Company into Panama's pro-independence movements. Up north, he successfully convinced President Roosevelt that American interests were best served by removing Bogota from the equation altogether. Then he simply sat back and watched the fireworks. On November 3, 1903, the Panama independence movement seized control. They proclaimed a revolutionary junta and unilaterally seceded from Colombia. By the time the Colombians realized what was happening, the seas were crawling with American warships and the rail lines into Panama had been disabled. Still weak from the Thousand Days War, Bogota had no choice but to surrender Panama without a fight. On November 6, the U.S. recognized Panama as an independent state. Days later, Varilla was made the new nation's ambassador. He immediately signed the Habenau Varilla Treaty, granting the U.S. everything that it had asked for. That December, French lands and equipment passed into American hands, while the 16-kilometer-wide canal zone became American property. When the majority of Panamanians figured out what was going on, they were outraged. They had just declared independence from one pushy nation, and now another was already violating their sovereignty. But by then, it was too late. The treaty was signed. The Americans were coming. Nothing in the world was going to be able to stop them. The construction of the Panama Canal over the next 12 years was a miracle of human ingenuity. It was also an extremely depressing example of just how awful ingenious humans are capable of being to one another. Work officially began on May 4, 1904, only to almost grind to a halt as workers refused to, well, work. There was too much danger. Too much disease. No American was going to risk their life for building a canal through some malaria-ridden jungle. The problem persisted until July 1905, when railroad specialist John Stevens came up with a simple solution. That same year, the sugar market had crashed, throwing many in the Caribbean out of work. So Stevens hired them, thousands of West Indians who couldn't say no to even the most abysmal conditions, since abysmal was exactly what Stevens had in mind. The zone existed under his own Jim Crow-style segregation laws, but even more stratified according to class and perceived morality. For example, men who were married were entitled to homes, while bachelors were stuck in grimy bunkhouses. On the class side, workers were divided into gold and silver roles. Gold roll workers, who were mostly, but not exclusively white, White lived in decent conditions and were treated well. Silver roll workers, who were mostly non-white, were treated more like slave labor. There were long hours and almost no health and safety laws. At Cobra Cut, 13 kilometers of canal had to be carved out through mountainous terrain using equipment like pickaxes, steam shovels, and dynamite. Work took place around the clock in the driving rain and in temperatures topping 30 degrees Celsius. 6,000 workers were on site at any given time. Unsurprisingly, there were accidents. While the Panama Canal Company had a contract with an American company to supply artificial limbs to injured workers, that only applied if you were physically working when you were hurt. If you just happened to be taking a break, if you happened to be on a company train that derailed en route to the site, well, no compensation for you. For the true horrors of working on the Panama Canal, you only have to look at the death toll. Officially, 5,609 workers were killed during construction, although many historians think the true total is higher. Of those thousands dead, only 350 were valuable gold roll workers, the rest were the poor, 
the non-white, and the desperate that the company treated as simply expendable. Yet there was more to building the canal than merely a tale of exploitation. Take Dr. William Gorgas, the zone's chief sanitation officer. Gorgas was the one who realized all the yellow fever and malaria racking the project was caused by mosquitoes. So he and his team embarked on a vast extermination campaign, fumigating houses, draining swamps, and cleaning stagnant pools of water. By 1905, the canal zone had recorded its last case of yellow fever. Over the next decade, malaria rates plummeted. There were also the engineering miracles. After John Stevens quit and was replaced by Lieutenant Colonel George Washington Girtles, the work really took off. A series of 12 locks was created that would each raise a ship 25 meters above sea level during its journey. What was then the world's largest dam was built across the Chagres River, creating the vast Gatton Lake. In the zone itself, hospitals, schools, and police stations all sprang up from lands that had once been only rainforest. It was the Panama Wilderness Tamed, the great American continent sliced in two, the dream of Charles V or Charles I finally realized. In May 1913, two steam shovels moving in opposite directions met in the middle of the canal, signifying the end was near. Five months later, in October 1913, Woodrow Wilson sat down in the Oval Office and pressed a button on a telegraph that sent a signal to a bunch of dynamite in Gamboa Dyke. When it exploded, it flooded the last section of the Cobra Cut. To all intents and purposes, the canal was finished. But while construction might be over, the story certainly wasn't. There was still the thorny question of who really owned it. So here's a quick quiz for all you trivia fans. What was the first ship to sail the length of the Panama Canal? If you guessed the SS Ancon, well, we hate to tell you that your history books lied to you. On January 7, 1914, the beat-up old French crane boat Alexandre Le Valet became the first vessel to traverse the canal, a feat today remembered by almost no one. But it was still a heroic milestone. More to the point, it allowed the Panama Canal Company to start planning a grand opening ceremony, one that would see dignitaries from across the world converge on this tiny new nation to marvel at US engineering. Or at least it would have had the organizers not scheduled the ceremony for August 1914. One month beforehand, World War I erupted, and that, well, that was that. On August 15, 1914, the canal officially opened not with festivities, but with the SS Ancon slowly making its way through the 12 locks under the command of John Constantine. And no, we never expected to publish a Geographics DC Comics crossover either, but. Apparently, here we are. After Hellblazer himself had piloted through the canal, the first transport ships started appearing. With the company charging by the weight, the money was soon rolling in. As it did so, life in the Panama Canal Zone got better and better. For the Zonians, as they were known, it was the American dream transplanted to Panama. There were high wages, restaurants serving American food, theaters offering the latest Hollywood movies. In effect, the zone was America. It certainly felt that way to residents. High schools flew the U.S. flag and taught in English. There were neighborhood bake sales and PTA meetings. At its height, some 100,000 U.S. citizens, mostly soldiers and their families, were stationed in the zone, equivalent in modern population terms to the U.S. Virgin Islands. But the success and prosperity in the zone were in stark contrast to the country surrounding it. Little by little, Panamanians started to notice they were unwelcome in the zone, that Zonians never came to Panama City to spend their money. They really rarely mingled. Slowly, resentment began to build. By 1951, the organization of the zone had been moved into two entities, the Panama Canal Company for the canal itself and the Canal Zone Government for everything else. Despite this, the governor of the zone was also head of the company, meaning all power over this 1,432 square kilometer stretch of land was concentrated in the hands of one man. In the late 1950s, that man decided to do something very divisive. He decided to build a wall. Well, more accurately, it was a fence atop a small wall, and there were practical reasons behind it. But visually, it looked like the Americans were trying to keep the Panamanians out. The Colombian ambassador even later referred to it as another Berlin Wall. Whatever the truth, for many Panamanians, it was the last straw. For too long, they'd watched the Americans lord over a chunk of their country on the basis of an unpopular treaty signed in the heat of revolution. Now, they were going to claim that land back. The ends of American involvement in the Panama Canal began on January 9, 1964. That day, students from Panama's Instituto Nacional marched into the zone and demanded the Panama flag be raised alongside the American one. When the Zonians refused, the students rioted. The riots lasted three days. In that time, shops, homes, and cars in the zone were torched. 24 Panamanians and four U.S. servicemen were killed. 
It was the start of a diplomatic crisis that would go on for a quarter of a century. By 1977, it was clear the rat had awoken Panamanian nationalism as effectively as the Thousand Days' War. That year, Jimmy Carter signed two treaties with Panama's leader Omar Torrijos that would eventually place the canal in Panamanian hands. The first treaty came into force on October 1, 1979. That day, the zone was officially abolished, although in practice it continued to exist, only now it was under Panamanian civilian control. At the same time, the Panama Canal Company moved to joint U.S.-Panama ownership. Yet U.S. soldiers still remained in Panama guarding the canal. Many Panamanians continued to resent them. It would take one last bloody catastrophe to finally settle things once and for all. In 1989, Panama ran elections under the dictator Manuel Norega to pick a new president. But when Norega's guy lost, the dictator annulled the election and declared that the U.S. had interfered. In an atmosphere of heightened anti-Americanism, four U.S. soldiers left the zone and ventured into Panama City. There, on December 15th, they were attacked by a pro-government mob. Three were badly injured. The fourth was killed. The result? The U.S. invasion of Panama. On December 20, 1989, 26,000 U.S. troops descended on Panama. Although the fighting was fiercest around government-held areas, it spilled over onto the streets of Panama City. In the carnage that followed, anywhere between 516 and over 1,000 Panamanian civilians were killed. Whole neighborhoods were reduced to rubble. Norega finally surrendered on January 31, 1990, after almost a month in hiding at the Vatican Embassy. As the American soldiers led him away, it marked the last time the U.S. would get involved in Panama. Nearly eight years later, at noon on December 31, 1999, full control of the canal and the zone was handed over to the Panamanians. After nearly a century, the U.S. presence was over. In the years since, the Panama Canal has hit a number of milestones. In 2006, Panamanians voted in a referendum to double its size, work for which is still ongoing. In 2010, the millionth ship passed through the canal. From a dream once dreamed by a long-dead emperor, traversing the isthmus of Panama in a boat has become utterly routine, even banal. Yet the miracle of engineering that is the Panama Canal has lost none of its luster. Today, the canal remains the premier crossing point for ships going from the Atlantic to the Pacific, with some 14,000 passing through its locks every year. But Chinese, Chilean, Japanese, and Colombian vessels are also represented. But the Panama Canal is something more than just a popular shortcut. In the walls and locks of the canal, we can not just see engineering ingenuity, but also stories. Stories of the humans involved in the canal's history, of the thousands who died building it, of the thousands more who lived alongside it for decades. The tale of the Panama Canal may be the tale of a dream that refused to die, but it's also a tale of the tens of thousands of ordinary people who risked their lives to make that dream a reality. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Do not forget to subscribe. Brand new videos just like this, currently twice per week. So subscribe, hit that notification bell so you find out when we put out a new video. Also, do check out our sister channel, Biographics. This video, it's about places, and everything on this channel is about places. On that channel, Biographics, we do people. So please do go check it out, and thank you for watching.